Hello everyone and welcome to this session. Um, uh, so we were discussing this session, the session, how to avoid the postponed GERD. Um, so we have uh, three uh, distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, so uh, we will have a many, many, um, very good session we have. So uh, expected. So first speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Um, Lobat Bechela. So uh, he is, uh, uh, chief of the uh, uh, Advanced Tissue uh, Resection Program in a Kingston Health Science Center, uh, Queen's uh, Hospital, Queen's University. So, uh, Lovat, so please start your lecture. Okay, so I'll just share my slides here. Okay, so uh, thank you, Inoue Sensei and the uh, organizing committee for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's always a pleasure to speak at this fantastic uh, worldwide conference. So first, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, post poem GERD and the current definitions and pitfalls before we talk about uh, how to avoid GERD. These are my disclosures. And in terms of the objectives, uh, I want everyone to know the current definition of GERD and the limitations in defining GERD in the post poem literature. Know the common pitfalls in diagnosis of post poem GERD, and to have a framework for diagnosing GERD post poem. So we'll start off with a case. This was a 36 year old man. He was four months post poem, and he's been off of PPI for one month. You can see his endoscopy here. And then the question arises Does this gentleman have GERD? So you can see he has very mild LA grade A esophagitis. And we'll come back to the case and answer the question if he has GERD or not. But based on much of the current literature, this might be categorized as GERD. So in terms of the reported incidences of post poem GERD, currently the rates of post poem GERD vary widely, anywhere from 0 to 58%. And the criteria for the diagnosis of GERD post poem also vary, and they include abnormal acid exposure time, and the cutoffs vary anywhere from 4 to 6%. Some also use a Demeester score of greater than 14.2. Endoscopy is also used, and any grade of esophagitis is often categorized as GERD. And some studies use symptoms. So they use validated symptom scores, such as the GERD-Q or health-related quality of life uh, related to GERD. Some use non-validated scores, and some use typical symptoms. And obviously the symptoms are problematic, especially in the achalasia population, because they often overlap with the symptoms of achalasia. So what is the definition of GERD? Uh, the Montreal definition of GERD is a condition which develops when the reflux of stomach contents causes troublesome symptoms and or complications. The symptoms are, or the cardinal symptoms are heartburn and regurgitation, and the complications are Barrett's esophagus and peptic strictures. However, there is no consensus on the definition of post poem GERD. In terms of the pitfalls in diagnosing post poem GERD, we'll break them up into the three main categories. So abnormal acid exposure time on 24 hour pH, esophagitis on endoscopy and symptoms. And these are often used in isolation um, in the literature. So we'll start with the 24 hour pH and I already mentioned some of the pitfalls, specifically the wide variation in the criteria used, the variation in terms of the cutoff between four to 6%, the Demeester score, and some studies don't even mention the specific criteria that they use. And here's a study to illustrate some of the other issues. So a study of 25 achalasia patients 25% had abnormal acid exposure time prior to treatment, and this was all due to fermentation. And after treatment, 50% of the patients had abnormal acid exposure time. However, half of them were due to fermentation. And studies have also shown a reduction in abnormal acid exposure time in patients after treatment due to reduction of fermentation. So what this does tell us tells us that abnormal acid exposure time post poem should not be interpreted in isolation as diagnostic for GERD, 
and it should be manually reviewed uh, for fermentation when it's abnormal. And next, we'll talk about symptoms. So in this study, they used, uh, or the use of a validated GERD questionnaire in 43 postponed patients demonstrated no correlation with abnormal acid exposure time. In another study of 103 postponed patients, 38% with abnormal acid exposure time did not have reflux symptoms or esophagitis. And similarly, in a study of 282 postponed patients, 60% with evidence of esophagitis on endoscopy or abnormal 24-hour pH were completely asymptomatic. So reflux symptoms and GERD questionnaires do not predict the presence of esophagitis and should not be used in isolation to diagnose post poem GERD. And now we'll move on to esophagitis on endoscopy. In a systematic review and meta-analysis of about 1,500 patients, uh, post poem abnormal acid exposure time occurred in about 39% of patients and esophagitis in about 29%. So 95% of patients had LA grade A, B esophagitis, while about 5% had LA grade C or D. And we'll see the issues of uh, LA grade A, B esophagitis in a second. This was a series out of our center. 20% of patients had LA grade A, B esophagitis. However, seven of the 10 had normal acid exposure time, and five of the seven had esophagitis only in the area overlying the tunnel. And subsequently, this healed without PPI. So LA grade A, B esophagitis, again, in isolation, is not sufficient for the diagnosis of post poem GERD. And now we'll move on to the Lyon consensus or the updated consensus for the diagnosis of GERD. And they proposed three key points for the diagnosis. First, conclusive evidence of GERD is an abnormal acid exposure time greater than six, LA grade C or D esophagitis, long segment Barrett's, or a peptic stricture. Then inconclusive evidence for GERD, where the acid exposure time is between four to six, where much of the literature uh, falls under this category in terms of classifying GERD, uh, LA grade B esophagitis. So if we have these particular parameters, then we have to look at ancillary measures. So the reflux episodes, mucosal impedance, manometry, and the symptom index in order to make a diagnosis of GERD. And then strong evidence against GERD is an acid exposure time less than four and a normal endoscopy. So how does the Lyon consensus change things? So this is the landmark study in the New England Journal of 221 patients that were randomized to POEM or Heller. And at three months, uh, reflux esophagitis was found in 57% of the POEM group and 20% of the patients in the Heller group. And then at 24 months, 44% of the patients in the POEM group and 29% in the Heller group. And the conclusion in the paper was gastroesophageal reflux was more common among patients who underwent POEM than among those who underwent Heller. So we had written to the authors and mentioned to them the, the inconsistencies with the diagnosis of GERD. Uh, and really, kudos to them. They, they subsequently published it in an editorial, a post hoc analysis using the Lyon consensus. And then what they found was at three months, 45% in the POEM group had conclusive evidence of GERD, and 31% in the Heller group had conclusive evidence of GERD. However, on follow-up 24 months later, only 28% of the POEM group had evidence of GERD and 29% in the Heller group. So using the Lyon framework, the incidence of GERD post POEM was not significantly different from the laparoscopic Heller at 24 months. And this is really the only RCT that we have uh, comparing these two objectively using endoscopy, 24-hour pH, and now the Lyon consensus. Now we'll go over an algorithm for the assessment and management and diagnosis of post poem GERD. So when you have your patient, three to six months later, they have their follow-up endoscopy off of PPI, usually for four to six weeks. And then they'll fall into one of these categories. They'll have LA grade CD esophagitis, LA grade A, B esophagitis, or no esophagitis with reflux symptoms, and then no esophagitis and no reflux symptoms. 
So if they fall into this first category, you diagnose postpone GERD, you treat them with PPI, and you confirm healing on follow-up endoscopy. Generally, we then follow up and reassess them every one to three years uh, as required. If they fall into this category, no esophagitis and no symptoms, they definitely don't have postpone GERD. When they fall into this category, then you do your 24-hour pH impedance with manual review if it's abnormal, and you use the Lyon consensus criteria. And then if they have a diagnosis of GERD, you move to the left category. If you don't have the diagnosis of GERD, then to the right category, and then uh, uh, reassess them as required. So back to the case. So the 36-year-old man, four months post poem LA grade A esophagitis on endoscopy. He was asymptomatic off of his PPI and normal 24-hour pH. So based on the Lyon criteria, he does not have GERD. And incidentally, one year later, he underwent his follow-up endoscopy, and you can see that the esophagitis completely healed without the use of PPI. So in summary, post poem GERD has had variable definitions in the literature, which has led to variation in the incidences reported. And the Lyon consensus offers the most robust framework for the uniform diagnosis of GERD. And the incidence of post poem GERD is likely lower than the quoted literature that relies on isolated use of acid exposure time, esophagitis, or symptoms. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much, Robert, uh, uh, the great talk. Uh, so deep insight uh, uh, to the post poem GERD. Uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, I, I totally agree with you are uh, in the uh, acarasia patient. So uh, they had no uh, peristalsis, uh, it's up to body. Of course, everybody knows and the, uh, uh, that means uh, no clearance of acid. So, so can we perform the 24 pH impedance? So uh, the uh, postponed patient, um, so acid exposure prolonged is a natural, natural, I think. So um, anyway, so uh, you proposed uh, the uh, uh, new algorithm uh, to make a diagnosis of a postponed GERD. That is uh, very important uh, for us uh, to define it. Uh, we can evaluate the uh, uh, clinically problem postponed GERD uh, accurately, I think. So, um, uh, do you have any uh, specific uh, question to our uh, Dr. Uh, Bechara, other speakers? Rob, that's a, a great talk. I think really bringing together a lot of information and helping to you know push towards standardizing everything. Um, do you have any patients in your practice uh, who have long segment Barrett's or strictures? This is the, the main thing that uh, at least people in the US worry about. If we take people off PPI, they're gonna get Barrett's, they're gonna get strictures. Uh, and so people argue to not even do poem because of this sometimes. So in our experience, we haven't encountered um, you know, Barrett's or strictures, but I think that's part of the important thing in terms of these patients. After you treat them, you need to continuously follow them indefinitely clinically at least and see in terms of their symptoms and then you can reassess endoscopically or with ph as needed down the line as things change but i think in terms of the incidence of uh, barrett's esophagus um, there's only a few case reports of barrett's esophagus post poem and there's actually some case reports actually of, of some of short segment barrett's from fermentation in patients prior uh, to any treatment as well so you know i, I don't think it's as as big an issue as sometimes it's, it's made to be um, in terms of the incidence of, of strictures and GERD, especially now when we see kind of with a prospective randomized controlled trial um, that the incidence long term or at least medium term doesn't seem to be particularly different uh, between Heller and Poem, uh, as we saw in the New England uh, paper. And I think the other thing that's important about it is that um, it allows for a bit more standardization in terms of reporting. Because as I mentioned, there's some studies that will, will report, you know, 10% incidence of GERD and others will say 60% incidence of GERD. And then often what happens is when people are scanning the literature, 
they'll just see the abstract or, or you know and read oh 60 percent incidence of GERD um, and then they'll get turned off of the procedure or worried about referring patients for the procedure just based on something that's catchy in, in kind of an abstract so I think when we have more uniform reporting of it um, it will also make things a bit a bit more uh, level um, when people are reading the literature um, and then thinking about referring their patients or the patients thinking about getting the procedure. Okay, so uh, so we will talk it uh, later again. So um, uh, let's move on to the uh, next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Yuta Shimamura. Uh, so he is an uh, uh, associate professor uh, at the Shoah University in Kota Tersa Hospital Digestive Disease Center. So Yuta, please uh, get started. Yes, thank you for your kind introduction. I will share my slides. Uh, my topic is uh, intra-procedural techniques to uh, minimize post-poem GERD. I will introduce our strategies to minimize the risk of post-poem GERD. I have no COI to disclose. The first poem was uh, performed by Professor Inoue, and to date we have treated around 2,400 uh, patients. These are our clinical results. Uh, clinical success rate uh, was 94.6%, and we saw significant improvements in IRP and ECHR score after POEM. Recently, there have been debates regarding GERD after POEM. In our institution, 15% developed GERD symptoms. However, they were controlled by PPIs, and only 5% were uh, considered severe GERD uh, with grade C or D erosive esophagitis. Uh, there were only three cases requiring fund application after POEM. This is a prospective multicenter study in Japan, which showed uh, similar results that severe erosive GERD uh, was seen in approximately 5% of the patients who underwent POEM. These are some of the recent uh, published studies. Uh, currently, the rates of post poem GERD vary widely uh, from zero to 60%. Overall, the incidence of post poem GERD are as follows, 20% uh, with GERD symptoms, 25% uh, uh, with erosive esophagitis, and 50% with abnormal pH study. As presented by Dr. Bashara, there is no consensus on the definition of post poem GERD, and further research is required to establish specific parameters for GERD in achalasia patients. Now I'd like to go over some of the methods that we do routinely to minimize the risk of GERD. First, uh, double scope method. And second, uh, POEM plus F, endoscopic anti-reflux fund application. Uh, double scope method is done in all POEM cases at our uh, center. Uh, second gastroscope is advanced into the stomach and the gastric cardia is observed in a retroflex view while the therapeutic scope is placed at the end of the submucosal tunnel. This is the image of our operating room. As you can see here, uh, two scopes are used, one therapeutic scope and one pediatric scope. A uh, second endoscopy system is required to perform this technique. Although it may be difficult to prepare an additional endoscopy system, we believe that this method is one of the most important techniques in POEM to maintain its quality. Here's a video of a uh, double scope method. You can see the scope advancing distally to the tunnel end. Transillumination can be used to clearly visualize the scope position. Here is another uh, case of double scope method. Uh, when the main therapeutic scope is in the submucosal tunnel, myotomy can be extended while observing it from the gastric side with the second scope. When we started applying double scope method, it was used mainly to prevent incomplete myotomy of the lower esophageal sphincter. Then, in our experience, we thought that the double scope method may be useful in re reducing the risk of GERD after POEM. There are two main advantages of applying this method. First, by using double scope method, the extent of the submucosal tunnel on the gastric side can be controlled. 
Secondly, the direction of the tunnel can be checked. These will allow us to avoid short or excessive myotomy and will help us in preserving sling muscle, which is an important component of the lower esophageal sphincter. The image on the left shows short submucosal tunnel and there is a possibility of incomplete myotomy. You can see the light of the therapeutic scope at SCJ. On the other hand, the image on the right shows the light of the scope few centimeters distal into the gastric side. These images show the anatomical relationship between sling muscle and class fiber of the stomach. This yellow area is the target area for the submucosal tunnel in the gastric side. These are several images of sling fibers that were identified during submucosal tunneling. When these are identified, it is better to avoid cutting through them. Of note, it is not always easy to identify this oblique muscle. In that case, double scope method plays an important role. When performing uh, anterior myotomy, the submucosal tunnel does not pass through the same muscle. However, the posterior approach, there is a risk of cutting through sling fiber. This image shows posterior approach without preserving sling fiber. The yellow arrow is uh, heading towards the fundus. This image shows uh, posterior myotomy with preserving the sling fiber. Uh, the yellow arrow is pointing towards the lesser curvature. Endoscopically, you can see the sling muscle fiber and the class fiber. And once identified, it is better to avoid myotomy of the sling fiber. This is the statement from a uh, clinical practice guideline for POEM that was published in Digestive Endoscopy 2018. Clinical question was, how should a uh, complete incision in the LES be confirmed? The statement was, the myotomy should continue up to one to two centimeter into the stomach to ensure that the LES is incised and dissected properly. This study was conducted at our center and published in 2019. This uh, was a three-year follow-up of a prospective RCT of double scope method. The conclusion was that gastric myotomy over 2.5 centimeter resulted in increased rate of moderate esophagitis without improving clinical efficacy. Now I'll move on to our new technique, POEM plus F, endoscopic anti-reflux fundoplication during POEM. The first case was performed uh, on August 11th 2017. Since then, we have done POEM plus F to 43 patients without any severe complication. We reported the clinical outcomes of our experience and showed that POEM plus F can be safely performed. Here are some of the video clips of this procedure. Full thickness myotomy is carried out inside the submucosal tunnel. Peritoneum is identified. We advance the scope deeper into the abdominal cavity. Uh, during this step, we uh, continuously visualize the targeted direction by using intragastric second scope. Once we enter into peritoneal cavity, enter wall of the stomach, and the left lobe of the liver can be identified. And first stitch is done on the anterior wall of the stomach. The assistant holding the baby scope controls the insufflation to help the full thickness suture. And by pulling back the scope, uh, suture is tightened up and fixed, creating the partial wrap. All cases of point plus F was performed successfully and median operation time was 46 minutes. There were no severe GERD symptoms, no severe GERD patient post-procedure. 13% had GERD symptoms, but only 8% required daily use of PPI. This is a list of anti-reflux surgery from right to left, anti-reflux effect is stronger. Door fund application is relatively mild compared with Nissen. Point plus F are classified as very mild fund application. 
This is suitable uh, for patients who have failed esophageal motility like achalasia. In conclusion, uh, clinically significant GERD post poem is infrequent at our center. Double scope technique is essential in order to avoid incomplete and excessive myotomy. The tunnel should be created toward the lesser curvature side to avoid cutting sling muscle. Point plus F is a novel intraprocedure technique to minimize the risk of GERD after POEM. Thank you. So thank you very much, Yuter. Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, you are uh, uh, emphasize the uh, uh, importance of uh, a double scope technique uh, to avoid the severe reflex, and also uh, uh, if uh, once a patient it's a, it's a, uh, yes uh, uh, prophylax prophylaxis <laughs> prevention. <laughs> Sorry, prevention of a uh, good. The technique is a, a new technique. Is a poet you introduced us. So, uh, any uh, specific question to or you uh, I just have a, a quick question. Um, so, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, the double scope uh, technique uh, definitely should be the, the standard uh, technique uh, for POEM to ensure the quality, as you mentioned. Um, but do you have any suggestions for some centers where they don't have the resources or they don't have, you know, for a second scope, not all of the units are able to have two towers um, in the room for, for one procedure. Do you have any uh, suggestions um, or comments about that? Um, in that case, uh, we have to know the anatomical landmarks uh, within the submucosal tunnel. Like you have to know where you are uh, while you're creating some mucosal tunnel. Uh, or uh, you can use like clips to identify which way you should go. That's another way to know which uh, direction you should go. Anatomical landmarks, as you know, there are penetrating vessels if you go into the gastric side. And also you can see the, uh, the vessel uh, changes, uh, spindle veins while you're in the uh, lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, those kind of uh, key anatomical landmarks should be uh, identified if you don't have a uh, double scope in the room. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's, it's very important, as you said, to, to be able to identify exactly where you are um, and know multiple features to indicate how far you've gone, especially without access to, to the double scope uh, but definitely, if it's it's if you have access to it, you should uh, use it every time. I think. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, it's a time uh, constraint. So uh, let's move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Kevin uh, Grimes. Uh, he has a uh, yes, uh, surgeon endoscopist, and the uh, he has a uh, conducting the uh, uh, therapeutic and uh, endoscopy program in a university of Cincinnati. So, um, Ohio. So, Kevin, so please uh, get started your lecture. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Inouye. Let me uh, share my slides. Okay. Uh, so, as uh, the professor mentioned, I'm a surgeon and an endoscopist focusing on upper GI at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, this is a photo of our uh, location. Uh, we're closest to Chicago, but uh, it looks very close. The distance from Chicago to Cincinnati is about 500 kilometers. Uh, so maybe the same as from Tokyo to Kobe. Uh, and then this is a, a picture of our river. Um, not quite Rainbow Bridge, but um, we still looks very nice. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, the objectives for this talk are to discuss treatment options in patients who have post -poem GERD. Uh, of course, uh, PPI is always an option for some patients. Uh, and then of course, surgery is a possibility with either the door fundoplication or the toupee fundoplication. Um, more recently, um, some centers are trying electrical stimulation of the LES. Um, this is a surgery procedure where they put two electrodes, uh, almost like a pacemaker uh, to try and tighten the LES. 
Uh, so far, this is reported only in one post palm patient, uh, and it seemed to work okay. Um, but um, for this session, we'll focus mostly on endoscopy options. Um, for this, we have the option of TIF, uh, ARMS or ARMA, and POEF. Starting with TIF procedure, this is, stands for transoral incisionless fundoplication. Uh, this is done with a specially built device. Um, these are all handmade. Um, through the center, you can place an endoscope to go in retroflex and, and see what's happening with the jaw of the device. Uh, this basically forms a J shape uh, and compresses the stomach against either the LES uh, or the esophagus, and then fires a full thickness fastener uh, from one end of the jaw to the other. Um, this is to create something that looks similar to a door fundoplication. Um, here you can see what the, the device looks like in a patient. On the left, uh, the device is closed. Uh, on the right, this is what it looks like when it's opened. And this is the completed uh, 270 degree wrap. Uh, and you can see the omega shaped valve similar to door fundoplication. Uh, so how does this work in palm patients? We have two studies so far. Uh, the first study is single center from America, five patients, 40% of them female, age 55. There were no adverse events. Um, average follow-up of about one year. Unfortunately, no pH data in this series, but 100% of the patients are off PPI. And of the three patients who had esophagitis before TIF, all of them healed. Uh, one of those patients did have severe LA grade C esophagitis. Uh, the second study we have about TIF is very new, published only about one month ago. Uh, this is multi-center from America with 12 patients, mostly female, age 57. Uh, they experienced two adverse events, one bleeding and one pleural effusion, and had seven months of follow-up. Uh, for PPI data, um, most of these patients were taking high-dose PPI before the procedure. Afterwards, about one-third are still taking high-dose PPI, one-third are taking regular-dose PPI, and the final third uh, are taking either occasional or no PPI. Uh, for esophagitis, all of the patients that they had follow-up for started with LA grade A esophagitis, so mild esophagitis. One patient got better, one patient got worse, one patient stayed the same. Uh, but it's important that none of the patients uh, in this series had severe LA grade C or D esophagitis. Uh, for pH data, um, they had reasonable follow-up for the pH data. Um, Demeester score and acid exposure time were both significantly decreased. Uh, however, you'll note that both Demeester score and acid exposure time stayed in the abnormal range after the procedure. Uh, and they had two treatment failures who went on to surgical fundoplication. Uh, the second option is ARMS or ARMA. Um, this stands for anti-reflux mucosectomy or anti-reflux mucosal ablation. Um, the idea with this is to create an ulcer at the gastric cardia. Um, this is done by submucosal injection, followed by, in the case of ARMS, mucosal resection with either EMR or ESD. And in the case of ARMA, mucosal ablation with cautery or APC. Um, this is a picture out of a, a, a conference uh, abstract um, from a group in Mexico. You can see in picture A is um, after POEM, but before ARMA. Picture B is their marking of one and a half to two centimeters of an area to spare to keep from doing a circumferential ablation. Uh, C is their completed ablation with APC. Uh, and then in picture D, this is three months after ARMA. You can see the healing and the tightening of the uh, EGJ flap valve. Um, so this is an abstract by a group in Mexico, single center with six patients, half of them female, age 55. They had three months of follow-up, uh, and they did have significant improvement in their Demeester scores and acid exposure time. Um, the patients with esophagitis, everybody healed, and in this group, they did have one patient with LA grade D esophagitis that healed after this procedure. 
Uh, the GERD resolved in 83% of the patients. They had one case of mild dysphagia, uh, but no dilation was needed for this. This is their complete data. Uh, and uh, you'll note in the blue box, the post ARMA uh, exposure time and Demeester score are both in the normal range. The uh, third option is POEF. This is per oral endoscopic fundoplication. Um, this is similar, but not exactly the same as to what Dr. Shimamura uh, just talked about with POEM plus F. Um, if uh, POEM is similar to Heller, the POEM plus F is the Heller door. For POEF, this is just the door procedure after the patient has already had myotomy. Um, so this is for post-POEM patients going back to only do the fundoplication. Um, this again is the, uh, involves a full thickness myotomy to enter the peritoneal space, uh, and then to perform an anterior fundoplication with either clip and loop or endoscopic suturing. Um, this is a cartoon of how this looks with the scope leaving uh, the third space, entering the peritoneum, uh, and then pulling the fundus of the stomach uh, back over the peritoneal entry. Um, this is a picture with the clip and loop. Um, again, putting some clips to secure the loop to the fundus, uh, and then tightening this so that the anterior fundus closes uh, the peritoneal uh, entry site near the EG junction. Um, and then this is a cartoon showing the same thing, but this time with suturing. Um, again, taking a bite of fundus and pulling this to create an anterior wrap. Um, this is done with, uh, at this point, a prototype suturing device that I don't think we can get in North America, but uh, currently is available in Japan, um, using an anchoring pledget and a barbed suture uh, so that you can work with only one, sorry, only one working hand uh, without having to tie any knots. Um, again, this is a video of how this looks. Um, this is actually the same video as to what Dr. Shimamura showed. Um, taking a bite of the fundus using this suturing device. And um, so far, um, three patients uh, have been done in the Shoah University for post poem, going back only for POEF procedure. All of them were male, aged 59. Um, this was all done safely with no adverse events. And as far as I know, so far, one patient has two years of follow-up with resolution of his GERD, um, healing of his esophagitis, and his PPI is off. Uh, so in summary, we have three endoscopic options for patients who don't want PPI and who don't want surgery if they have the post -pulm GERD. Um, the endoscopic uh, fundoplication can be done with TIF or POEF. Tightening of the EGJ can be done with ARMS or ARMA. Um, we have a few studies for each of these. They're all very small, uh, but so far very good and promising results. Um, of course, larger studies with more follow-up will be helpful uh, in the future. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Sure, thank you very much, uh, uh, Kevin. Uh, the nice presentation um, that you are uh, mostly focusing on the uh, how to manage uh, the post good. So any specific question to our uh, Kevin? It's okay. So uh, let's uh, move on to the uh, discussion together. So um, so we have uh, two big topics. So first one is the uh, diagnosis, diagnostic criteria of the postpone bird. And second is uh, how to manage the postpone bird. So, uh, so first, um, so, uh, Robert, uh, so would you mind, sir, uh, summarizing uh, your talk again and the uh, your proposal? Robert, please. Sorry, sorry just summarizing it? Yeah, so, the, yeah, sorry, your proposal. So, so I, I think the keys are, when you read the literature, the, the definition uh, of GERD in the, in the post poem literature is highly variable, and this results in the huge variation in the reported incidence. So I, I think that that's one key point. 
And the other thing is trying to have a uniform standardized approach to the diagnosis, uh, specifically the Lyon classification or Lyon criteria. Um, it's not perfect and it's not specifically made for achalasia patients. However, it gives us the most uh, robust or objective way to, to diagnose GERD, um, even in the achalasia patients. I think down the line, we probably need a specific criteria uh, for postponed patients or, or post-treatment of achalasia patients um, that we can apply universally in the literature just to make sure that you can compare one study to the other study. Because right now, in terms of the incidence of GERD, it, it's very hard to compare one study to the other because everyone uses uh, a different definition of GERD. So those are uh, the key take-home points, um, I think. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, actually, in your presentation, you showed us the uh, some uh, endoscopy image at the postponed GERD patients, uh, uh, lozenges A, B. So I, I think, uh, so if the patient has a severe uh, GERD symptom, um, it's a problem, but the uh, so grade A, Los Angeles grade A, B, uh, erosion, doesn't matter. Don't you think so? So, so in a regular, regular endoscopic uh, examination to uh, uh, normal population, uh, we, we quite often encounter uh, grade A. So in, a, in Japan, so we uh, have established the uh, uh, screening program for gastric cancer. So nowadays, the, uh, uh, more than half patients have the uh, grade A aspagitis. So uh, yes, so it's a uh, diagnostic classification for GERD, um, but, but I think uh, grade A, so allergen, uh, not uh, matter. Uh, uh, how do you think about it? Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think that's what the, we see in the literature, that a lot of patients have LA grade A, B esophagitis. A lot of them don't have symptoms. And uh, in, in our series as well, a good proportion of them heal without any PPI. So I also think in POEM, I wonder as well in terms of just from doing the tunnel uh, in that particular area, because it undermines the, the microvasculature of the mucosa, perhaps it's mild ischemia that looks like reflex esophagitis, um, or maybe the mucosa is more sensitive even to lower amounts of acid. Uh, but a lot of these patients don't have symptoms and subsequently heal down the line. At least that's what we found in, in our uh, population. So I agree with you, LA grade A, B esophagitis, a large proportion of them is, is really not clinically uh, relevant and doesn't end up being uh, diagnosed as GERD. Yeah, um, uh, Kevin, so you also mentioned that the, uh, you asked to the uh, uh, Robert, uh, so right after his presentation, that the, uh, uh, do, you, do you have experience of a stricture or Barrett uh, after a uh, porn procedure, you asked. So that means that you also think the uh, grade CD esophagitis is a matter, as a matter, uh, but the uh, grade AB uh, does not matter. So, uh, Kevin, so your uh, opinion, please. Yeah, so I. I agree. I think that um, mild or even moderate esophagitis in isolation at a single endoscopy probably is not uh, not a big deal. Um, it's something that maybe it heals on its own, or uh, certainly in uh, in America, everybody takes PPI. They buy it at the drugstore themselves without even asking the doctors, uh, and so L A A B even C esophagitis. Uh, patients can heal on their own, either with or without the PPI uh, that they pick up by themselves. Um, if it's severe esophagitis or if it's longstanding and they have severe symptoms, then uh, I think at that point, it, it's important to make sure that we have healing in some way, either with um, a surgery procedure, with an endoscopy procedure, or, or with PPI. Uh, but this seems to be a very, very small number of patients. Yes, so uh, we, we can say that the uh, 
uh, endoscopic uh, examination, uh, if we find out the uh, CD uh, esphagitis, uh, then uh, we can say uh, it's a false form GERD, definitely. So, and the uh, second question is, uh, I think, uh, our 24 hour pH impedance that works the, uh, for a college patient to evaluate the post -form GERD. So that is the question to three of you. Is, is it, you mean, is it worth doing the 24 hour pH impedance on post -form patients? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah. a summer uh, meaning. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I think uh, definitely in terms of, to, to also better diagnose GERD and to get better literature, I think it's useful to do the 24-hour pH impedance. Um, we do it on all our patients uh, routinely, but in clinical practice, I think it's really only useful for the patients where the diagnosis of GERD is not clear. As I said, like LA grade A, B, but they have lots of symptoms of GERD. To know, are these symptoms due to stasis or are they due to acid reflux? And the other thing that's important about the pH is that if it's abnormal, I think it has to be manually reviewed because if it's not manually reviewed, you'll miss fermentation um, because the automated readout will automatically say, oh, the abnormal pH uh, exposure time of you know seven or 8%. But if you actually manually review it and you see a lot of it is stasis um, and the pH doesn't drop very low uh, as you see in true GERD. So with stasis, the pH will only go down maybe to about four uh, or three, uh, three point five or so. Um, so you can usually remove those from the recording and know and find out what the true uh, GERD incidence is. And often, if you remove the fermentation and see what the uh, acid exposure time is, it's it's not elevated. Um, so I think you have to get your motility expert to review the pH study if it's abnormal uh, to make sure um, that it's not just fermentation and we don't diagnose GERD uh, inaccurately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you don't... Uh, yes, I, I completely agree with uh, Robert. Uh, I think 24-hour pH study is very useful but the interpretation of the results uh, is very difficult. So I think uh, manually uh, reviewing the results is the key point when we uh, assess with a 24-hour pH study. So Kevin? Yeah, so I, I occasionally will check a pH on mostly younger patients. Um, the older patients, uh, I find uh, everybody likes just to continue PPI. Um, and so there's no reason to check, is there any abnormal acid exposure? It's the, the young patients in the practice who um, we'd like to try to turn it off and they have some symptom or they have uh, some esophagitis that we'd like to investigate. Uh, but honestly speaking, for me, it's maybe, maybe one patient in 50. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, uh, three of you. Are uh, that uh, at this moment uh, we can say that we have to uh, propose. So based upon the Robert uh, suggestion, um, uh, it's better to establish the uh, uh, criteria for post form GERD. Otherwise, uh, just confusion. So particularly uh, involving some incomplete incomplete myotomy patients or more and more complicated. <laughs> The particularly pH impedance studies, the stasis, stasis, and the, uh, uh, lots of confusion may happen. So, so, so thank you very much, everybody. Let's move on to the treatment option uh, for post form GERD. So, uh, Kevin uh, summarized the uh, various treatment that you also mentioned it. So, uh, any comments uh, from uh, Robert? So, so I just have a question about the, the treatment, uh, Kevin, in some of the studies. Um, in some of them, some of the patients subsequently went on to have a Nissen fund duplication. Um, is there any data on those patients in terms of how many are still on PPI uh, after the Nissen fund duplication in the uh, post POM patients? Yeah, so uh, there's not a lot of information on patients who go from POM to surgery. Um, and, and even less information on the ones who go from POEM to endoscopic treatment like TIF to surgery. Um, they, in, in that particular study, they mentioned that they had two uh, who went on to uh, fund application. 
uh, and they leave you to assume that that took care of the problem, but they don't say that specifically. Okay, so um, Andy, uh, Kevin, so you are mentioned about the uh, application of the AMA procedure to uh, postpone GERD. And the uh, uh, South American doctors reported it's a good result. That was uh, abstract uh, of a GDW, maybe. Uh, yes. So their uh, results is uh, so good. So it's a big surprise for me. It's the reason why. So <laughs> uh, we have uh, one case application of our armor after uh, yes, a postponed girl patient. So um, yes, so uh, once their symptom improved, but the control of the, it's, it's a, a very, very um, direction is a, um, so uh, not the same direction, it's a, uh, uh, the facing each other. So what I mean is the uh, uh, balancing between the uh, uh, poem procedure itself open, open the LES and the uh, uh, armor procedure is a close the open window. So uh, the two different directions, totally, uh, uh, how should I say? Yeah, so it's the, I think it's a very delicate balance. They're yeah, both yeah, going in the opposite yeah, direction. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, so sweet spot is a very small, mm -hmm. not not wide, not a big, not a big target. So very, very, very delicate balance in between two uh, procedures. So I think uh, um, it's the same to a dough fundplication. Dough fundplication is a just uh, covering covering on, it's the same to teeth. Teeth is the same to bear this uh, surgery. So uh, make uh, uh, some uh, lap, lap onto the open uh, window. So uh, it's a uh, uh, very mild fund plication. So I, I, I myself uh, feel support uh, or fund, uh, endoscope fund plication or dough fund plication or teeth is a uh, good uh, procedure to control the postponed uh, Maybe uh, Kevin can comment on it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think as surgeons, we like the one that looks most like the surgery. Um, we do heller door, and so we want an endoscopy option that matches to what a door should look like. Um, and I, I think that's a good option um, in places where you can perform it. If you have access to TIFF, then I think TIFF is a good option. If you have access to uh, endoscopic suturing um, with your device where you can do a POF or a POEM plus F, uh, I think that's a good option. I think the advantage of the ARMA is that anywhere in the world we can do this because if you have the equipment to do POEM, you also can do ARMA by using injection and by using whichever knife you have. Even if you don't have APC, you can still use the same knife that you use for your POEM to make the mucosal ablation. So I think um, it doesn't look the same as to a door, but I think it's, it's more available throughout the world um, without so much variation. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you very much for your uh, nice comments. So particularly uh, regarding the uh, armor procedure, the major advantage of uh, armor procedure is that it's a, a low price. So we just use an APC and the um, uh, technique is a very simple. Uh, that is a uh, advantage of the uh, armor procedure. Uh, for postponed that it's a de delicate delicate balance is uh, uh, necessary to uh, control the uh, reflex disease. So, any other comment, Yuto? Um, as you mentioned, I think Arma, you have to know the balance. Uh, you don't want it to be too tight. Uh, we have to remind ourselves that you know, um, Achalasia patients mostly have absent uh, motility. So I think we have to keep that in mind when we choose the, the, the treatment of this uh, post poem guard. So thank you very much to all the three speakers. So today we have uh, discussed the uh, very, very important point. So how to make diagnosis as a diagnostic criteria we need it. 
So U1 is needed for postpone good. The second is uh, uh, we have to uh, make, uh, develop the uh, uh, algorithm uh, specialized uh, for the treatment of a postpone good. Okay. So uh, please keep a discussion after this session. <laughs> so thank you very much, all uh, three of you. And a great discussion and a great talk. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Inoue. Thank you. Have a nice Thanks. day. Thank you. You too.